This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast from booktopia.com.au. I'm Mark Harding, and today I'm thrilled to be bringing you a wonderful chat between Booktopia's Stefania Campagna and best-selling Australian author Trent Dalton. Trent is the author of the novels Boys Swallows Universe and All Our Shimmering Skies, but his new book Love Stories is a collection of real-life stories he was told when he set himself up with a typewriter on a busy street corner and asked passers-by the question, could you tell me a love story? Over to Stefania for this chat. I'm Stefania Caponia, Booktopia's non-fiction category manager. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Walkley award-winning journalist and one of Australia's most loved and multi-award winning authors, Trent Dalton. Hi, Trent. Hey, Stefania. And thank you for joining us. Hey, Bye. thank you, Stefania. Thanks for having me. It's, oh, you're it's, very really be, it's really cool to be on, like, you know, one of my all-time favourite, you know, book oh. podcasts. So it's uh, it's really cool, yeah. Booktopians love you. Everyone says hi. Oh, man. Hi. <laughs> They're oh, man. Don't even speaking. get me started. I love those Booktopians. And, you know, there's there's a couple of planets I'd love to visit. Jupiter, Mars, and Booktopia <laughs> is also the one after Mars. So, uh, yeah, no, I love that place. <laughs> So today we're talking about your latest book, Love Stories. Um, So this is such a beautiful idea for a book. It's also a beautiful book. The the product is actually lovely. thank you. Yeah, yeah. So particularly at this time when people are struggling, we were talking a little bit before we joined about COVID and lockdowns and how hard it's been for everybody. So can you maybe tell our listeners a little bit about this project and how the concept for the collection came about? Yeah, that's it's beautiful, Stefania, where you sort of the way you say, particularly, you know, the context and that that really did play a big part of in the back of my mind, I was sort of kind of and I'm really kind of neck deep in kind of working out what I'm going to do for my next fiction novel. But I don't know, it was sort of partly COVID. I felt so that to me felt so indulgent to me to kind of not acknowledge the wider world that was sort of going on around me. And I thought, well, no, I don't want to write, um, you know, 80,000 words about a pandemic, but can I write something that kind of gives a middle finger, raises a middle finger to the pet pandemic and kind of brings a bit of joy into the world. Now, at the same time as that, um, ah, oh, man, it starts with a love story really. And it's the love of a dear friend of mine. Um, I've got, I've got like, I think maybe four best mates. And uh, one of them is this guy named Kel. Um, he's, real name Greg Kelly we call him Kel um Stefania I don't know whether you have this person in your life but this person Kel for me is the guy that brings me back down to earth and uh you know I I had very good reasons to for my head to leave this planet for a while in the past three years of my life and it's been wonderful and all these brilliant things have happened but some sad things have happened this guy Kel is just always there for me and um and he's a dear friend and he has been for you know decades and uh but this guy's mate uh this guy's mum uh Kath Kath Kelly um she passed away on Christmas day 2020 and that kind of naturally rocked him and kind of I loved her I really thought she was a really really impressive woman and she died at the age of 89 and um she liked words she loved books the last book Stefania, the last book she bloody ever read was um, All Our Shimmering Skies, my, oh. my, my second novel. Yeah, it was like she, you know, Kel tells me, she goes, mate, guess what she was reading? And it was just freaking deeply moved me. And she lived for words. She had this 1960s sky blue Olivetti typewriter and uh, she'd write letters to, to uh, the people at her local church, to editors of newspapers, to anyone and she wrote about letters wrote letters sort of defending women's rights and human rights and everybody's right to not be a knucklehead (laughs) and um and and she'd write to me and uh and she'd often cut out little pieces of my journalism and my mate kel showed me you know when she passed these beautiful scrapbooks that she had with with my articles in them and and it's just deeply moving and then we're at the we're at the funeral we're at kath's funeral and um, as per her request, um, we were all, all the people who went to the funeral, we were all meant to go out to the car park into, and open up Kel's car and, and inside uh, was an esky filled with all these Forex Gold beer cans. I don't know if you're, you know, you might know some Forex Gold <laughs> up in Queensland where I'm from. It's a pretty popular beer. 
there's all these cans in Kath's fridge when she got sort of, you know, rushed to hospital still left over. And she told her son, Kelly, you know, make sure you drink those cans at the funeral. <laughs> so we're standing outside at the baking heat, Stefania, and we're just like, you know, hot as anything. And, and we're just talking about this beautiful woman. And I'm like going, you know, it's, we're, I'm remembering all of the, the things and all the beautiful ways she loved words. And then Kel says to me, Hey mate, well, well, wait till you see this. And he opens up his car again and he leans into his boot and, uh, it gives me chills just telling you, Stefani. I have, I've not, not really spoken this story out loud to anyone. So it's, um, and I mean, I write about it in the book, but I haven't told the story just openly like this. And it's giving me chills as we speak. And he leans into his car, Stefania, and he, he pulls out bloody 1960s sky blue Olivetti typewriter, Studio 44. And he hands it to me and he says, uh, mum, mum wanted you to have it. I'm getting teary thinking about this because it was so freaking moving. Because, you know, it's just like, it was like January 6th. It was like not long after she passed. And, and this gift, man, he just gave me this gift. And it was so beautiful. And, and it just really got me thinking about how bloody lucky I am and, and, and how good it is to know women and people like Kath Kelly and have them in your life. And these people who have support, she supported me right through for 20 years as a journo, Stefania. And yeah. she'd send me little articles, little messages after stories I'd write and just, Hey, you got that one. You know, you got that one right, Trent. And just really pushing me along and urging me to go further in my writing. And anyway, a couple of weeks later, I just sort of, you know, it was COVID everything just started thinking about what I wanted to write. And I just said, you know what? I just want to write something that's just not cynical. I just want to write something truthful and deep and, and just honest and, and, but, but bold and, and, and loving just the same ways that, that Kath Kelly was deep and honest and bold and loving. And, uh, and I did, and I called up Kel and I said, mate, I've got this idea. I want to take Kath's typewriter out to the corner of Adelaide and Albert street on, you know, in the heart of Brisbane city. And I just want to sit on a desk and I just want to write about what I see and I'm going to have a sign, right? And uh, I told him all this. I'm just going to, I'm going to have a sign and it's going to have um, sentimental writer collecting love stories. Do you have one to share? And I just said, man, I'm just going to write whatever, whatever happens. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just write about whoever stops, um, whatever I see and whatever love stories are told to me. And, you know, unbelievably, Stefania, they, um, you know, about 150 people stopped and they told me the deepest, most beautiful love stories. And, you know, I got, I got by the end more love stories than I could handle than the book could cover. Um, and I just plugged them all like heart and soul just into this thing that you've got in your hands, you know, love stories. And it's kind of, um, and I'm just so proud of it. And I was so proud of that. I, I did something that I knew Kath would have really enjoyed. Like she loved nothing more than having a yarn. You know, she lived in this street called Jack street in Brisbane for 67 years, you know, and she was that leaning over your fence just listening, you know, and that was the whole point. I was like, yeah, man, I'm just going to listen. Well, lost generation of that, isn't it? Lost generation, yeah. right? I mean, it doesn't happen. And no. that whole idea of, you know, we're too fast, we're too busy. Yeah. And this is, this was just slowing down. This was just, yep. All right. I've got these two ears, right? And if I can remove my fairly large ego <laughs> for just three months and I can just walk around and sit in this spot and just listen to other people and get out of myself, you know, get out of Boyce Wallace universe and all our shimmering skies and yeah. woe is me or Trent's, Trent's past or all this stuff, man. And just listen, just listen to other people's stories. And, uh, and it was so beautiful. So man, it's given me like, it's so nice to talk to you about it, Stefani, because I'm like, I've got it. so First many I'm questions. Sorry. Like, so, well, there's yeah, a lot of things to unpack on, totally. on your yeah. introduction. It was wonderful. So one yeah. of the things that, you touched on, so you were speaking about going to the funeral and then receiving yeah. this, this Olivetti. And to me, um, personally, something you mentioned about the funeral is the photo montages that oh. these days they do at all the end of all those funerals, which um, personally, I'm, I'm like you, I find that's the part of the funeral that always breaks me. Oh, oh you I can be sitting yeah. there, I've held it all together, and then those photos start, the music starts, and I'm in tears. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I thought about it a lot while I was reading the book, and um, why does it break us in two, like you said? And I think it's the fact that this entire person's life that you've, a lot of them have been older people for me, like, like yourself, someone that you've known, was, as their friend's 
I was going to ask Stefania, who, who's it been for you? Like, have you Oh, had... lots of, you know, aunts. And, yeah. yeah. I think I'm at the age where it's my friend's parents. Uh, isn't it? Yes. We're at that my age. Friend's parents. And then my, my own mum passed away. We didn't do the the, pre, the slideshow for my mum. Too hard. Because it's too, too hard. Too it's hard, yeah. Hard. But, um, yeah, and it's that whole thing of seeing that whole person's life <sighs> squashed down into a few minutes and you see it from start to finish and it just breaks you right? oh man i can't do them i can't i mean it's making me it's making me emotional thing i'm th- just, when you say that i'm thinking about my old man's one we had um we had white a shade of pale playing at my old man <laughs> and i was just like man i can't even hear that song anymore and uh because i just you know i see my old man as a six-year-old boy as, and then to the 65 year old man that he was when he passed. And I can see all of those photos, you know, yeah, and, and it's and, all progressing, right? Oh and, man. It's, and, it, it's like that, that whole thing of, um, you know, when they say that someone while they're passing away, their life flashes before their eyes and then oh, you've got it there on a, on a slide project. Oh, I mean, we, 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 as a society have turned that sentence life flashing before your eyes into a thing at funerals. Yeah, this right. hasn't always been the case, but it's, you will see them at every funeral you go to now. And it's so beautiful. Like it's so sad, but it's so beautiful. And, and it's because it's humanity, it's life. And yeah. that stuff right there, Stefania, is like at the heart of everything I want to write about. That right there. Like and it's that came like, through for me in the book. Oh, to man. me, it was like, oh my God, he went to a funeral. <laughs> he saw that slideshow. And then he wanted to capture that person's oh. moments right and put it down so we didn't have to wait for the slideshow oh man you're amazing stefania that's exactly what i did i swear oh. to god and i think subconsciously that's exactly what was in my mind and and us i wanted to write i wanted to write in words right i wanted to do a slideshow for every person i met on that street yeah so it's like tell me your slideshow basically and that's just so freaking right stefania that and that's how all the stories read it, they often start with they often start with someone young and then they go to, to falling in love, yes. um, often losing someone and then often saying goodbye and have, and then often living, living with loss and living with love as a much more ethereal thing that we have to hold on to. And that thing that we all feel in those funerals. And man, I don't, I don't find funerals um, hard. I just mm-hmm. find them such a celebration of yes. life. And, and that day, man, that day watching cats was profound to me because it reminded me, right? I'm such an idiot, Stefani. I, I get, I think it's all about what next good book I'm going to write. I, I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I sometimes think that, that life is about me dazzling the world with my words and I'm such a dick. And I go to that funeral and there's people right dead set, Stefania. People couldn't find a seat. They could not find a seat. Latecomers could not find a seat at Kath Kelly's funeral. And I was so freaking moved by that. I thought, holy shit, of course. Yeah. How many people, how many people are gonna find it hard to find to, to get a seat at my funeral, you know? And I was just like, God damn it, I've got it all skew if sometimes, you know, where yeah. where where okay, there's there's a case to be made. This is why the tuck shop lady is happier than the millionaire, you know, yes. and, and because everyone freaking loves the tuck shop lady. Everyone loves her because she's worked her ass off to work at relationships throughout 80 years of her life. You know what I mean? And no. what's, what's more successful and what's more, you know, and, and I just love that notion. I love the notion that love is an equal opportunity phenomenon. So and did then, you find people opened up to you quite easily? Oh, that, you'd be so surprised. You'd be so surprised how much people will open up. How often, how often do you get to sit for an hour with someone and just let rip? You know, that's a very powerful thing. That's a great gift you can give someone. It's like, and I would just say, I would start, you know, the mate, it was from, from the place I was coming from was such an easily accessible place for people. It, I'd just start with, hey, can you tell me a love story? And if they didn't have a story, I'd often just start, well, all right, can you do this for me? Can you just tell me about someone you love? And then often they'd go, oh, Harry. And then, and then so, but in telling the story of how much they love Harry, they tell the most amazing story. And so um, it was such an accessible notion to build a conversation on. Love, bang, that's it, you're in. You're, and, and you know what? You're already 100 miles past real estate. You're, you're 100 miles past small talk. You're going to the deepest thing yes. that we all connect to, you know? And, um, and that was really amazing. But also 
because I was vulnerable. I was the vulnerable guy sitting alone like a douchebag <laughs> behind a desk, behind a sign saying, sentimental writer, please tell me stories. And you're really exposed. Like it was, there was, you know what it'd be like. It'd be like you sitting on, um, you know, what's the, you know, is it George Street in Sydney, yeah. you know, or whatever, some, you know, Pitt Street Mall. Pitt Street, it'd be like you sitting in the Pitt Street Mall and you just really sharing your feelings and, you know. Because I was going to ask that, describe for us what that corner is. Yeah, so, so it's... For people who, has, who haven't been to Brisbane, I was trying oh. to visualise, well, what's what were your surroundings like? What yeah, were the Pitt... sort of typical people walking oh. past? Yeah. Oh, I think, Stefania, Pitt Street Mall is an excellent comparison. So, so where I was sitting was just in front of King George Square, which was the main thoroughfare, you know, main meeting spot in Brisbane. And, you know, brilliantly, as, as it unfolds in the book, I later discover that a lot of couples used to meet right in the very spot where I was writing my book. Oh. And, and, but people just pass, there's people going everywhere. And this is the beautiful thing. I wanted lots of people. You just, you know, just so like, just get as many contacts with as many human beings as possible. And, you know, I might have gotten 150 stories from people who stopped and told me the most beautiful things. But, you know, 400 people must have had interactions with me in terms of like, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing, you crazy person? And, but, um, but yeah, and, and, it, and, and it's just there's access to the bus terminal um, beneath King George Square. Then you're leading right into the Queen Street Mall. And that's the beauty of staying in the one spot, though. Here's the cool thing. It's like staring at the ocean. It's like it's like. If, if I had sat and stared at the ocean for two weeks, you would eventually feel the rhythms and the colors of the ocean and the tide times. And it became like that on this corner. I would see the same people. I would see the same couples and we'd interact and then they'd stop and they'd add more to their stories. And so the rhythms of the place, you could start to understand. It became like this massive sort of photographic kind of literary art project where I was just watching from the same spot, watching the world and watching life, you know, so you'd watch a mum, you know, fix the buckles on a kid's helmet, or you'd watch a dad hold his young son in his arms. And then you'd watch a couple kiss and then you'd watch a couple fight. And then the same couple would come back holding hands and not even know that they're a part of my own story now, you know? And so it's just this, it became this wonderful sort of colorful kind of, um, uh, dream, you know, it was like a fever dream in many ways. If if you stop and start looking at life with fresh eyes and not just letting it pass you by, you know, really noting all the details, it suddenly became sort of like this sacred spot. It's really ridiculous. And now I drive past that spot and I go, far out, what what was I doing on that corner there? People must have thought all sorts of things, but it was so beautiful, you know. And eventually people were just going like, oh man, this is so cool. Like and, and they would see who you were. But you were oh, anonymous or did people that, recognize that you were the author of Boy Swallows? You yeah. Know? Oh, it's funny you say that. Like, you know, there's a real benefit there. You know, I, I thought there might be some downsides to writing, you know, God, don't let me get started on my downsides of writing Boy Swallows Universe. But, you know, that's really from my heart and soul, that thing. And it's like every, every sacred kind of fearful, you know, all of the things I was ever worried about talking about um, are inside that book. And the great benefit of that is, is that um, anyone who read that knows that I put my cards on the table. You know, they know who, where I'm coming from. And that was really helpful on that street. So it would start sometimes as like, oh, are you really the guy who wrote Voice Wells <laughs> Universe? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then they'd start maybe with that. And then like, so what are you doing? And, and I'd tell them, and they'd go like, oh, was that real, all that room and the red telephone and the drug dealers? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'd really give, you know, I'd give my story to them. And then by the time I'd tell my story, they're like, all right, all right all right, I'm going to tell you a love story of my own. And then that's when they go deep. It's all about sharing and trust and kind of shared storytelling. And that can become very powerful. So it really helped definitely on the street. So do you think also having the typewriter as opposed to having a laptop there, do you think that oh. also influenced the way the stories were told? Oh, Stefania, you're, man, you're, you're really insightful. That's a great question. It, it really added to it and it really helped. Uh, there were so many particularly I'd say, you know, maybe men and women around the age of like 70 who would stop and tell the most amazing epic love stories because they just want to spend time with the typewriter. They wanted to spend time with Kat's typewriter. And, and, you know, I just remember, you know, I remember a woman named, um, you know, ah, oh, two, two friends, Henny and Denise, you know, they, they, you know, about, about that age, like seventies, you know, incredible love stories they're telling, you know, um, Denise was the woman who told me the love story about what it felt like to be in the palliative care ward, standing at the end of a bed as she conversed with a woman about the angel that this dying woman could see. 
and Denise and both Hanny were just going, yeah, I used to write on that. I used to write on those things and so many people passed and, and, and the, the physical object of a typewriter, this is why objects are so important too. And why we keep the things from the people we love. Same reason why I know that's why Kath wanted me to have the typewriter. She, I know that, that that's why she wanted. And my mate Kel wanted me to have it because he knows that I value those things because I know the stories that are within that, because I know the story of Kath is inside that typewriter. And I could, I could, it was such a great sort of start point where I could go, Oh, let me tell you where I got this. And people just go, Oh man, that's beautiful. And then it would kind of make their day. And then they'd go, Oh, you know, you know, once I received something and you know, or yeah, just people would stop, you know, just various, it just endless people would stop and go, Oh, you know, you know, the object that means something to me, uh, it's a shark's tooth, you know, or, you know, um, uh, Bill Stafford tells me the story about his, his whaling grand, his whaler grandfather, you know, who, who raised him, you know, and then, and that leads to him talking about the sorrows he feels about breaking up with his wife and not being a better husband. And, you know, one object can lead into a hundred different stories. So speaking of objects, yeah, yeah. books are beautiful objects in themselves, oh. not just beautifully written, but beautiful oh. objects, yeah, including yeah. this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, your even your uh, your first nonfiction book <laughs> about the sea. <laughs> oh yeah, by seeing stars. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous. Beautiful. I didn't realize it was yours until I started doing a little bit of research, and I went, I loved that book. I, oh man, thanks, in the, Stefania. In my previous yeah. bookstores, I always used to go and put it face <laughs> for, <laughs> facing forward because that was you. That was you who did that. I saw that. I noticed that. Thank you. <laughs> so. How much are you involved in the creation of the artwork and these covers? Like, how oh. directly involved are you? Oh, well, as far as um, I, I have a gazillion ideas, Stefania, right? This is how it works. So Catherine Mill, the amazing editor I have at HarperCollins, she goes, uh, Trent, do you have any ideas for the book cover? <laughs> I, 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 it, my brain explodes with a million and one ideas. And um, they are never as good um, as the ideas that Darren Holt, this amazing um, designer at HarperCollins has. So, and I, I cannot even tell you, like, if you think I'm enthusiastic or whatever, like talking on one of these podcasts, man, you should see my emails, to Stefania. <laughs> it's like exclamation marks everywhere as I'm sharing these ideas, you know, and it's just spitball ideas, just bang, bang, bang. Like this one, love stories. It was like, we should have a city. And uh, the cover should look like a city because it felt like love is everywhere. Love is just in the air in a city. It love stories passing east, west, north, south. And uh, and I'm like, I would like, you know, and, and the city should look like a heart, but not just a cheesy love heart symbol. You know, I mean, a human like muscle heart. It should look like that. And, and you know, it should be sort of morph, you know, just dysmorphic and just all these amazing kind of uh, <laughs> things. And then they go, Oh, Trent, hang on. And they sent through the design that Darren did for the cover of this, you know, and they said, actually, we're just thinking this. And it's just so beautiful. Yeah. With little gold flecks and it's hard back and it's just so simple and wonderful. And it's an original piece of art designed by Darren and all our shimmering skies, you know, I had all these grand, I had this sort of gone with the wind type idea. <laughs> Stefani was so ridiculous. I even said with the, I said those words to Catherine. I said, it should look, it should look like gone with the wind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then and then Darren comes back and he's just created the most amazing yeah, artful design where the story the whole story is hidden within this amazing dreamlike sort of tropical landscape and you know and with a rising sun behind it and then all um, Boyce Waller's universe I mean don't even get me started I had these ridiculous notions of a cover that took place on a linoleum floor from the 1980s of housing commission um, thing. And, and we had this textured kind of lin lino <laughs> that you could feel, you know, on the so book. You were, cover. Going, you were going for the gritty and they were going for the. <laughs> That's what happens all the time. That's what happens all the time. I go for this grit and this kind of cool Mac McCarthy kind of earthy stuff. And then invariably they send a picture of what it's going to be. And I go, holy shit, that's amazing. That's you got to do that. That's so beautiful. And they've done it again. Yeah. I can't wait to see that thing actually on, on, you know, in the shelves and in people's hands yeah. and, you know, and, you know, just, it's sort of, it's, it's kind of really beautiful. I, I do believe, I think you're right. They are, they are objects in themselves. I mean, there's a, oh man, there's a story in the book about, you know, this lady who works in this archive bookshop and, you know, real secondhand, you know, exchange bookshop and, you know, she, her love story ends with her discovery of, you know, a hundred year old book with this woman's beautiful black and white 
portrait in it. And the whole love story revolves around, you know, the message that's on that book, which is, you know, you know, love you forever, Gladys. And then it's just sort of simple, but it's a love story. And yeah. she knows obviously that, you know, you know, love is passed down through these, through these things called books. You know, that's why they're the most sacred things around to me. But, um, you mentioned a few different people there. To me, the, there's two that stood out, and maybe yes. because of where I am at my life at the oh, moment. Great, great. But um, the two women who are lifelong friends since childhood. Yeah. And to, what the thing that I kept thinking about was the fact that they hugged in front of your <gasps> table for more oh. than thirty seconds, right? Yeah. And you were talking about how people tend to hug for three seconds. And I was thinking, oh my God, people in Brisbane were hugging. Oh, I haven't yeah, yeah. hugged anyone in almost two years. So oh. I meet up with my friends and it's like, oh, hello. We kind of wave oh. at each other with our masks on. So I'm kind of missing the, the hugging part. Oh, so yeah. funny. I'm feeling for you, mate. Like, seriously, that's no, no, that's. But I think a lot of people in Australia are feeling like that. We we're, were mentioning Brisbane, uh, sorry, Melbourne and Sydney at the moment that have been yeah. in lockdown for a long time. But even when we weren't in lockdown, in those moments between lockdown, there was a hesitation to, to hug people, right? I haven't hugged my dad because oh. he's, you know, his age, I'm, oh, I'm worried. Man. So we just don't do that anymore. So oh. that story, apart from everything else that happened in their life, but the fact that they were hugging and then all the... Um, the, the comments you write about, you know, the three second intervals on people. Yeah, Do you yeah. really only hug for three seconds? That's, that's well, my, oh, it's that's that's a fact. We we humans only hug on average for three seconds. And I wonder post pandemic where that will increase a bit, you know, yeah. and it's, um I mean, I, I really hear, I'm hearing you when you speak about that and your dad, you know, and I know that, you know, you mentioned your mum before and he's, he's lost his, his wife, you know, oh, and, yeah. and I, and, and it's like, man, God, that guy needs a hug. And then, you know, I remember peak of lockdown in Brisbane, you know, and I, as I've said before, I just do not, I, I, I speak sort of very um, cautiously around it, complaining anywhere near for as a Brisbane person about anything pandemic related. But I remember going to my mum's house in the peak, you know, and she, she's had a few sort of health issues and, and, you know, I couldn't hug her. And, and she came in to hug me and I said, mum, we didn't know what this, this is early days, you know, and we didn't know what this thing was. And I was like, mum, you can't do that. You can't. You can't hug me. You can't go around just hugging people. I felt so bad. It was so terrible to sort of request that of her, like, don't hug me, you know, and she's a, you know, she's like a thing, you know, like she's just by herself. She lives by herself alone. You know, it doesn't have a lot of human contact, you know, and it's just like, shit, man. The one thing she lives for is probably a, a hug from her youngest son. And, and, and it's funny you say that about that story. That story was so beautiful. Um, that's Robin and Rochelle, those two friends. And she talks about, I just well, amazing you can that. remember all these people's names. Oh no, <laughs> they're deep to me now because I've gone back out, you know, them so many, many times. But yeah. thank you for highlighting that one. Robin and Rochelle, yeah. they hugged for 30 seconds. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what the hell is that? And and I just gently just sort of asked them. Like I was like, excuse me, my name's Trent Dalton. Can you just please tell me why you hugged each other for that long? And that simple question prompted the deepest discussion between them both. And they laughed and they thought, geez, isn't that funny that we did hug that long? And they said, we actually caught up five days ago, but they were hugging because they'd had a tough weekend. And, and Rochelle in particular was going through a bit of mental health stuff and, and that all unfolded in their story. And then Rochelle, she goes, Trent, she sends me a letter. She writes me a letter like days later. And on an, on an email, I give her my email address and, and then she just lets rip. She lets it all out and she goes, all right, you wanted to know why we're hugging for 30 seconds. And she writes the most passionate letter about what Robin means to her. And it goes back to kindergarten and it goes back to the fact that, you know, she was, she was ready to take a life at some stage multiple times. And it was this woman, Robin, who saved her from that. And, and that was all in that 30 second hug. I'm getting chills just talking about it because this is life, you know, and, and, Robin and Rochelle would have treated that. They were just catching up for coffee. That's all they were doing. But that was so sacred if you can twist it and turn it back around and go, hang on, let's stop and slow down a bit and let's look at what is actually inside that hug that we do. And this is what all those people in that pandemic are missing out on. That Those hugs aren't light, man. Like yeah. it is the greatest interaction. We take it so lightly, that human thing of a hug. And hugs sort of funnily enough kept on being a theme. So many people stopped um, where this guy, I remember this guy was taking photographs of me. And he came in and the previous person he'd taken a photograph happened to be Bruce Morecambe, Daniel Morecambe's father, the poor yes. kid abducted up here in Queensland. And, 
And uh, he goes, this is amazing. I can't believe the second person, I think he was doing a photographic class and his job was to go out and take shots of random people in the street. And he goes, I can't believe the second person I photographed is you, the author of Boy Swallows Universe. And, and then he starts talking to me about his kids who are 42, 41, 40. And he goes, you know what I still do? I still do the bear hug. He goes, do you ever do the bear hug? And I go, nah, man, I'm, I never do the bear hug with my kids. I still do the, I do the three second hug still because my kids are like 14 and 12 and they're like, I don't know, they're at that awkward girl age where they're like, dad, just you know, get off with me with all your love. And I just like, Stefani, I swear after this book, man, I swear, I swear I just hugged them the bear hug like this guy told me to. And then, and then that conversation with him made me start talking about my hugs with my old man and my hug, my old man never hugged. He was such a bad hugger. And like, you know, he's gone. And Stefania, I would, I would, I would give, man, I would give, I would give every penny I have made writing books for a 30 second hug with my old man again. You know what I mean? I would give, I would, without a second thought, man, I would take it. Here you go. Take it. You know what I mean? And it's like, so it's just, you know, the hug is everything. And it became sort of everything in that book, you know, and, and a freaking, the whole book kind of ends the whole book. I love that. It kind of ends with me realizing, you know, I won't spoil the ending, but it does lead to a, there's a thread running through that book and I love how it does. And it's that it's all about connection and it's all about how um, I don't need to know someone um, all my life to give them that hug and to, to feel that way, you know, and, and to feel really close with a stranger, you know, and um, I, I, that's what that book's taught me as, as, as well as like a hundred other things, but you know, you know, the power of a hug, certainly. Yeah. So what would you like people to take from this book when they read it? Oh, you know, you know, the bit, Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, take, take from it the thing you already know you know, take from it the thing you know deep down, you've known it forever, is that we're not here for the real estate and we're not here for um, for the cool car. Um, yeah. We're here to work at loving, right, man? Maybe, I don't know how many people you can count up on your fingers and toes, Stefania, but, you know, I reckon I could probably get to about maybe 15 people that that are in my world that are just, that that I know love me, unconditionally and i'm so freaking lucky for that you know i reckon maybe i reckon i'm then maybe there's 20 that i love unconditionally you know and and the thing i've learned though let me tell you stefani the truth of that is is sometimes i screw up in that you know sometimes i forget not to work at those relationships and i've been a bit lost in myself as i've sort of been mm. maybe whatever you know getting lost in words and writing books and stuff and i and this book and it's the same thing I'd hope if anyone takes anything away with it is that all of those relationships need work yeah. and, um, and, and they, that you, you don't own the love. The love is not yours to own. It's yours to work at. And it's the greatest gift that people decide to give to you. Like they give you their, their, your love. And then you don't ever get to own that, but you get to get everything out of it. You get every beautiful thing that that love instills you with confidence, um, it takes the fear away. Um, it makes you do amazing things. It makes you, it makes you freaking write novels. You know, it made, it made me write books, you know, the love of my wife. Absolutely. I call her my left thumb love, you know, my first one, man, count up your fingers. I start at my left thumb. I'll start there. She's my left thumb love, you know, and that woman made me do such incredible things, but I, I don't own her left thumb love, you know? And so it's sort of like, that was really a great lesson for me. So it's like, you know, go back, man, get back to the kitchen and start working at keeping that left thumb love, you know? And so it was sort of a great lesson. And so many of the stories that were told to me, a lot of the downsides in those stories, a lot of the low points were when they'd forgotten to work at the love. And, um, you know, and I just think, I think this whole two years has taught all of us that it's like, man, who did we get on the zoom to, you know, who, who did we, who do we rush to text in the darkest hour? You, you, it's the, it's, it's the people it's you can boss. count. <laughs> like right i mean not it's your not boss. your boss it's not the person that you no, you don't mind watching on instagram or something it's your freaking yeah. it's your dad man it's yeah. your dad you know and it's like and it's you know that's yeah. that's so beautiful and and that's what i did you know and i just think i remember in those early days of this pandemic it was so sort of you know we didn't know where it was all going or whatever and i just i thought the love that was kicking around australia at that time was really beautiful and it's yeah. naturally just turned into like all sorts yeah. of frustration and yeah. we're a bit over this thing now but you know I think we all remember that, that that was sort of, um, there was a lot of love kicking around and, you know, and it's still there, of course. And um, it'll be, I think it'll be even bigger and brighter 
once this thing's past us, you know. So it's um, I'm so glad to sort of throw a book out there that kind of taps into that. Yeah. Well, look, we've gone over our thirty I'm minutes, sorry. unfortunately. No, that's oh, okay. Man. I, I mean, could talk to you forever. Yeah, Stefania, that's because my the first question you asked me, I spent ten minutes answering, and I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so that's you know, yeah. No, I'd love to be here for for much longer, but unfortunately, yeah. we're going to have to wrap it up. No, so, hey, um, thank you your, so much. Your questions are beautiful, and thank you. Oh, man, I just really enjoyed the chat and it was so filled with love. And thank you for giving me an insight into your little bit of your, you know, where you come from with love. So that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so for all our listeners, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. You can pick up your copies of Love Stories from your bookstores in November, or you can order it online from Booktopia. Hell thank yeah. Thank you all again for listening and never stop reading. Thank you to Trent and Stefania. You can order Love Stories right now at booktopia.com.au where it is our book of the month for November 2021 and you can get it for special member pricing right through the month. Visit booktopia.com.au to find out how. Thanks for listening and as always, never stop reading.